Hello, my name is Jamie Cass, and I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. I work here at the Biodiversity and Biocomplexity Unit, which is run by Professor Evan Economo. We mostly study ants, and I will be teaching today about data subsetting for evaluation. I am reporting from sunny Okinawa, unfortunately, in front of a bare uh, white wall. So my apologies. Let's start the presentation. So first a bit about me. I graduated um, with my PhD uh, from City University of New York under the tutelage of Professor Robert Anderson. My topic was uh, the effects of biotic interactions on species ranges. So I am still interested in modeling those ranges and associated biotic interactions, but I'm also interested in mapping biodiversity and community change over time and space. I'm the author of a couple of R packages, uh, Wallace, um, the new version of ENM eval, which is not quite out yet. Um, the reference for Wallace is below on the bottom left. Uh, there'll be a section in this course about that, which I will co-teach. And on the bottom right is a paper I published recently with collaborators where we modeled the migration range of the monarch butterfly in Mexico using biotic predictors. So if you're interested, please check that out. My current projects uh, are uh, estimating temporal variability of ant communities on Okinawa. Uh, the plot to the right shows total ant abundance over time at our collection sites, and it peaks in the warmer months because ants are regulated by temperature. And uh, the other project is estimating global ant richness uh, with a very comprehensive occurrence data set. So let's just jump right into the presentation now. First off, um, why evaluate a model at all? So we probably want to know a couple of things about our model that we made. One is how well it predicts our data. Our data, meaning the data we input to the model the data that the model knows. But we also want to know how well it predicts new data. This might be data from a different space uh, or a different time. We're also concerned with whether the relationships with predictor variables actually make ecological sense. And uh, this is where we put on our ecologist hat and we can make decisions uh, based on our levels of expertise. We also are interested in uh, whether or not the spatial predictions make sense. So when we, when we create a map of suitability, whether that makes sense. And we also need our ecologist hat for that. I won't be talking about these last two things, but they are things that we are generally interested in. Uh, when we evaluate models, I'll be focusing on the first two, um, predicting um, uh, data given to the model and also predicting data that is new to the model. So a bit about model complexity. Uh, first off, all the plots I made, I made an R. Uh, I will be sharing the code that generates all the plots. I'm going to try to, uh, uh, to annotate it uh, in a way that makes it easy, more or less, to read. Uh, so if you want to fiddle around and, and play with those plots and analyses, um, uh, I think it would, it would help the learning process. So please check that out. Um, so I generated this data randomly with an underlying quadratic distribution. I took out a big piece of it. It's probably clear which piece that is. Uh, I just wanted to point out the data is messy, so you don't get all the pieces. Um, also, uh, the, 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 the true shape of the thing you're trying to model is not always a nice line. What we can do is we can use a very complex algorithm to um, try to fit the points as best as possible. Um, so we're trying to fit the data given to the model as best as we can. Um, but sometimes we can go a little crazy and, and fit this extremely complex signal that is not very good at predicting uh, any new data that might come in. So uh, you can see that this complex algorithm kind of went nuts uh, in, in the space where there's no data and went all the way uh, down and all the way back up again if we add independent data from that region that's missing, it would not do a very good job of predicting it. So uh, we need to be certain that the um, response makes sense. In this case, it, it probably doesn't. We might want to simplify this uh, a bit. But even in regions where we have data, um, 
it, we see all those jagged uh, peaks and valleys, and uh, uh, those are probably not uh, good for predicting new data either. We can go the other direction. We can make a model that is too simple. So in this case, uh, it looks like the signal we're trying to model is quadratic, but we fit a line to it uh, that is not going to be um, a good predictor of our, of our existing data, uh, nor of our um, new data. But ironically, it's a better predictor of the new data than this one. Uh, so again, pluses and minuses. Uh, so we don't want the data, the, the model to be too simple either. We need a Goldilocks model that is neither too complex nor too simple. We don't want something directly in the middle. We prefer things that are simpler. We prefer models that are simpler, but they cannot be too simple. That's the point I'm trying to make. So here's <coughs> a nice quadratic curve that proudly predicts the data missing pretty good. So uh, this brings us to machine learning algorithms. So these are um, complex algorithms that have tuning parameters that allow you to control how complex the model can get. So you can make a very simple model with a machine learning algorithm, or you can make a very complex one. It just depends on the tuning parameters that you set it with. Some examples are Maxent, random forest, boosted regression trees, neural networks, lasso regression, um, things that use regularization, uh, so on and so forth. There are many other examples. Uh, so when you're using these things, it makes sense to build a set of models that vary these tuning parameters and then uh, decide on optimal settings among them. So uh, what is a model evaluation strategy you might want to use? So first off, each model should be able to accurately predict the input data. Of course, this is the data that the model knows. This is the data the model is trying to fit its response to. And we call this training data. It's the data used to train the model. Uh, we also want to know, can the model accurately predict new data? Um, just because it can predict training data does not mean it can predict new data. If we have an independent data set, uh, we can evaluate each of our models on it. So for each of the settings we choose to test, we can evaluate those models on an independent data set and see how well it does. That would be great. Unfortunately, uh, we usually don't. And even when we do, we want to try to use as much data as possible to train the model. Uh, in those cases, we can evaluate the model on subsets of the training data. And I'll show you how that is done. This, by the way, is called cross-validation. So our study species today will be the giant anteater. I chose it because um, it's really cool. It looks crazy. Um, and uh, I wanted to focus on South America. So I downloaded the data from GBIF uh, with the R package Spock, which is a great package for downloading data um, from multiple databases. There were 400 initial occurrence records. However, after processing uh, geographic and spatial filtering, I took out some points in the Caribbean. I, I used SPThin to uh, uh, make sure that there was um, good spacing between the points to reduce uh, spatial autocorrelation and uh, all sorts of biases. And uh, now we have 155 points. Those are the points I displayed. The backdrop is temperature. Uh, I chose South America because it has a cool um, uh, uh, climatic gradient and is, is useful for, for the kinds of uh, spatial and environmental blocking that I wanted to show. So how do we evaluate models when we tune? So as I mentioned, we could ask how well the model predicts the training data. So on the left, you see all the training points. They're all in black. It's just one big group. And I see how well the model predicts them. Um, the metric I'm using is AUC, which is a measure of discrimination, model discrimination. How well can the model discriminate between occurrences and background points? It should be able to do a good job. Um, uh, I ran these models in Maxent, and on the uh, right side, you can see feature classes for Maxent. Basically, the more you have, the more complex it is. Um, linear is L. 
that's simple. Q is quadratic. Um, H is hinge, so splines. That's pretty complex. And P is product, which is uh, all the interactions of all the variables, so super complex. Uh, purple is LQHP, which is the most complex. You can see it does the best. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the regularization multiplier, so the penalization of complexity. Um, one is not penalizing complexity very much, so allowing lots of complexity. Five is, in, is uh, enforcing simplicity. So um, RM of one with the highest number of feature classes does the best. That's the most complex model. Um, is that really true? Um, for the training data, yes. In general, uh, who knows? We'd have to take a look. Something else we can do is see how well the model predicts independent data. So I made up an independent data set um, smack in the middle of the Western Amazon. Those are the orange points. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I evaluated the model on those orange points for each of the models I, I tested. So again, I'm tuning uh, the models by, by changing the feature classes and regularization multipliers to allow uh, complexity and penalize complexity in different magnitudes. And, and I'm, I'm looking at how well each of those models does. So for AUC, you can see that our purple line is now well below uh, most of the other ones. And now the, the, the one that does the best is this LQ in green, linear quadratic, which is a much simpler model. And it gets a, a much higher um, a testing AUC, so AUC on testing data now instead of training uh, um, than the, the more complex models. To the right, we see an emission rate plot. Uh, the lower, the better. That the, the lower emission rate, a lower emission rate means that you're emitting less points um, uh, from the uh, prediction once you turn it into binary. So you turn everything into ones and zeros. You basically predict suitability. You say, this is suitable, this is not. And then if uh, any points are in unsuitable areas, those are emitted. You don't want that. You'd prefer to have them all within the predicted range. Um, you can see that our LQHP, the purple line, actually resulted in emissions when the regularization multiplier was, was low, when it was allowing lots of complexity. So the complex model here is not doing very well. Um, alternatively, if we, if we want to include all of our data, and we don't have an independent data set, or even if we do, we want to add it to the training, we can ask um, how well the model predicts holdout data. So we, we separate the training uh, data into subsets which we call testing data, testing data subsets. And uh, I'll go over how that works, but basically um, you uh, build a model on all the subsets but one, and then you evaluate it on the left out subset. And so uh, you take the uh, average of those um, evaluation stats, and you can plot them too. And so you see here for AUC on the left, um, the, the best performer is L, the green line. Um, which is the simplest model. Um, but you also see that the AUC values are much lower than they were before. They're 0.5s, whereas before they were 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.7. It's because the model has a much harder time of predicting this left out uh, set because as you can see, they're, 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 uh, they represent different areas of space and therefore different environments. And I'll go over uh, uh, what the effects of that are um, in a few. For emission, we also see that L does the best, it has the lowest um, emission rate. So the simplest model of, of them all um, uh, actually does the best, um, uh, which, which, is, which is counter to the conclusions you'd reach if you just looked at training data. So the, the, the conclusions you reach are, are, are quite different when you um, do cross-validation, especially when you're, you're, you're blocking things. And, and I'll, I'll get into detail about that uh, later as well. So how do we predict holdout data? In other words, how do we do cross-validation? So to do cross-validation, we split the training data into K groups. K is the number of subsets. Here it is four. K is four. So the training data is on the left in black, the black points, and the subsets are on the right. Here we're using spatial subsets. So we break up the, um, the extent into four spaces, and we uh, subset the points accordingly. We have red, blue, green, and purple. Then we train the model on k minus one subsets, so three. We train the model on three subsets. So we add the blue, purple, and green points into the same data set, leave out the red points, 
build our model, and uh, then we evaluate that model on the red points that are left out. Calculate some evaluation statistic, be it AUC or emission rate or, or Boyce index or, or whatever you want. Then you repeat that for all case. So then we leave out blue, we build a model with red, green, and purple. We leave out green and so on and so forth until we uh, exhaust all the iterations. Then at the end, we take summary stats. So we take the mean statistic, we could take the standard deviation, and so on and so forth, and we can plot these things. So I, I made these plots with the NM eval. You can make them with other packages too. And we compare how each of the models did. And so in this particular case, for this particular iteration, uh, the red line H does the best, although the differences in AUC are quite small between 0.84 and 0.81. So relatively trivial, I guess. But if we compare those to the um, training AUC using just the training data, they'd probably be a lot higher than 0.8. Um, and we'll talk about what that means. So that's how to do cross-validation. Uh, what is an ideal data subset for cross-validation? Um, ideally, we'd like a relatively even number of records across the subset. So we don't want one subset to have one point and all the others to have 100, because that really wouldn't be fair. However, this is not always feasible when the number of records is low. So uh, when we have a low number of records, say we had 15 points, we wanted to build um, a model and, and, and we wanted to use five subsets, uh, that means that uh, each subset has three points in it. 15 points to model is already low. However, each model is built with 12 points and, and evaluated on three. So we're reducing the number of points available for modeling and as you get lower and lower in points, along with all the other caveats that, that come with modeling with few uh, data points, um, you're reducing your n. You're reducing the number of points available um, to dangerously low levels. And so there are, there are ways around that, and I'll talk about that. Um, we also might want even sampling across the environment uh, for, for our subsets. This is not always feasible when records are absent from certain environments. Uh, however, th this also might not be desirable at all when the goal is extrapolation. Uh, I'll get into this, but um, wh when you want uh, the model to, to um, extrapolate uh, during a cross-validation, when you want it to predict to new conditions, you want, uh, you want one of the subsets to represent uh, new environmental uh, conditions. And so even sampling across the environment is not always preferable. It just depends on what the goal is. So uh, what is the purpose of cross-validation evaluation? Um, you need to make a decision on what you want your model to be able to do. And so here's where we get into the extrapolation interpolation difference. So the ability to predict the conditions in your training data is interpolation. These are the conditions known to the model. Uh, the ability to predict new conditions is called extrapolation. And so uh, when you make an extrapolation, you might be predicting to a new uh, area of space or a different time, maybe the future or the past. And those conditions might not be known to the model. They might exist outside of the conditions associated with the training data. So you need to ask yourself, uh, what do you want your model to do? And then uh, once you decide that, then you can subset your data to make the appropriate model evaluations and then rate the model's ability uh, to do those things. So I want to talk a bit about block versus non-block subsetting. So block subsetting means partitioning the, the data with some kind of underlying structure that's similar to the what we did uh, when I showed the cross-validation example uh, where I blocked by space. So there's some kind of underlying structure we're using to, to, to make subsets and it's not, uh, it's not entirely random. Um, uh, the, the plot on the right is from a paper that um, goes into this in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, Rada Sablovic and Anderson in 2014 in Journal Biogeography. They compared um, randomly partitioning with um, some kind of geographic structure, but then this masked geographic structure, which um, uh, also part, um, subsets the background data. So um, this gets into the, um, this, this brings us to the important point that with, with, with most of these block subsets, the cross-validation should be subsetting the background data as well. However, it's uh, 
I, I actually have not seen any papers that did a thorough examination of this, and it's kind of um, uh, not really decided exactly what the best practices are. But but um, in in I think in in most cases you'd want to be subsetting the background too. So when you're making your 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 model, you'd be excluding um, um, background points from that region that is left out. Um, block uh, subsetting block cross validation usually results in poor evaluation metrics because it's harder for the model to make those predictions because uh, uh, things like extrapolation are happening and and therefore um, basically the evaluation is stricter and so um, uh, you should expect to get um, evaluation metrics that are lower in general than those that are used for training or for um, non block subsetting. A great reference for um, cross validation, block cross validation in general, is Robert et al. Um, 2017 in echography. He's, I, I put a, a, a one of their figures um, in there, in the middle. Uh, but they go over lots of different kinds of block subsetting, uh, spatial, temporal, different kinds of grouping, um, even hierarchical phylogenetic ones. Uh, it's a great reference. I, I suggest you, you uh, read this if you're interested. So um, I'm going to go over ways to subset. The first one is the is a simple one. This is um, called leave one out um, or jackknife. And uh, what you're doing is um, each group is a single point. So you're building uh, your model on all points but one and evaluating on that one point. And they're repeating the process over and over until all the points are exhausted. This technique um, was shown to be very effective for low data species. Um, the reference down there is Shaglavideva and Anderson, 2013. Check that out if you're interested. Um, but uh, basically, if you have a low data species, this might be a, a good technique to use because it allows you to maximize the number of points available for training. Um, another way to subset, which is frequently used, is random. So you basically attribute each um, uh, data point with a group randomly and you just choose the number of groups. Here I chose four, so k is four. Um, here I've plotted the environmental space uh, on the left. Um, that's um, annual mean temperature by a one on the x and um, annual mean precipitation by a 12 on the left, on the uh, uh, y-axis. Just to show kind of what, what um, proportion of environmental space we're sampling, um, uh, across the occurrence points for each of our subsets, because it, it, it can be quite different. Um, for random, you see that the samples are, are similar. They're a little bit different, but they're mostly sampling similar portions of space. However, it's not, uh, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily get the same ones every time you randomly sample. Um, so uh, when people do random sampling, they usually do multiple iterations of it because every time it changes, so you might, <coughs> excuse me, you might do it a uh, hundred times and then take an average, um, but you are not assured to have a, a, an even sampling of the environment across all your subsets every time. Um, a way to better um, get even sampling of the environment is to use a spatial checkerboard. So on the top um, uh, right, you see um, how space is being subset. There are four different checkerboard colors, um, and uh, points are put into whatever bin they fall in. Um, it, it's hard to see because you need to do lots of iterations of the random to, to, to show the differences. But um, in general, for a spatial checkerboard, you get a better even sampling of the environment across all of your subsets. Um, and, and because it's not random, um, you don't have to do it 100 times. You can just do it once. Another way is to make really big blocks. Um, I call this the balanced spatial block because you're you're trying to um, balance the number of occurrence points in each of your blocks. Here we don't necessarily get that because the blocks are of a defined size. Um, because we have lots of data and they're evenly spaced out more or less, you get pretty good um, even sampling across your subsets. For this one, you're insured to get the same number in each of your subsets, um, and, but the blocks are very big. Because they're so big, you end up getting uh, different regions of environmental space. You could see uh, for number four, you have a very small uh, portion kind of on the right side, um, 
Whereas for number two, um, you don't get a lot of the points from number four, you get more in, in the middle and so on and so forth. And so you get different regions of environmental space, different um, environments are being uh, sampled here. So you're forcing the model to extrapolate when you build it on one, two, and three and evaluate on four because four is a different, represents some kind of different environmental regime. Um, and so uh, uh, if your goal is extrapolation, something like this with big spatial blocks or some kind of environmental um, subsetting might be um, uh, the way to go. So the, the, the previous three were done with uh, the package ENM eval. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this one is done with a, another great package called block CV. Uh, the reference is on the bottom right. Um, this allows for um, a lot more different kinds of um, uh, block subsetting um, than, you, than uh, we had in ENM eval, and so it, it, ex it extends it quite a bit, um, and it also allows lots of flexibility with how to specify it, um, each of them. So this one is random spatial blocks, so the, uh, uh, you define the block size, um, however, the, the way they are laid out is random. So this is something you could iterate multiple times, similar to the random subsetting, except that it is also spatial. So um, uh, one, one potential issue here is that the, the sampling of, an, of occurrence points across subsets is not equal all the time. You can see that with uh, number three. However, iterating multiple times should, should relieve that, that, uh, that problem. And here we have um, environmental subsetting. So this is subsetting in environmental space. So we're not using geography um, the, uh, the coordinates um, to, to, to subset uh, uh, the occurrence data we're using their environmental values. Um, it's a bit confusing, but on the top right, I use the occurrence and the background data together to define my groups in order to show how uh, South America would be environmentally subset if you split it into four groups. And then um, below, I'm using just the occurrence data. Um, so uh, the environmental values are different. That's why the subsets look different but just to kind of show what both of them might look like. Um, and you can see that, uh, um, uh, you know, subset four, it has a very small little region of environmental space that is different from all the others. And, and you get maybe uh, better partitioning of the environmental space um, in general with this um, technique um, in, in comparison to the balanced spatial block. However, what you do have uh, here is um, spatial autocorrelation between certain groups. So you can see red and blue uh, on the right side are actually quite close to each other. Um, and, uh, they occupy a similar um, geographic space. And so that, that might be an issue um, for, 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 for some studies. So again, each of these has, has positives and negatives, but it's good to explore all of them. Um, I don't want to overdo uh, this, but I just wanted to show how the conclusions you reach can be very different depending on which kind of um, um, data subsetting you do. Uh, so we have random on the left, in the center, the, the balanced spatial block, and on the right, checkerboard, uh, spatial checkerboard. And you can, I, I, I've uh, circled in red where the, um, the best performing uh, model setting is uh, for each of these stats. On the top, we have AUC. On the bottom, we have emission rate. Um, you can see that they're different for, for each of these. And so uh, one thing I'd like to point out is with the, with, the, with the spatial block in the center, you get uh, simple models, generally simpler, that do better because it has to do extrapolation. And when you need, to, with the model, when you need the model to extrapolate, having a simpler model um, that usually does a better job of predicting new data. Uh, and for things like random, you tend to get uh, uh, more complex models when you're looking at AUC. Um, and, uh, but that's not always the case with emission rate. So another thing I like to point out is that uh, it's important to look at multiple metrics when you're doing model selection, when you're trying to select settings, um, uh, because the, the performance um, of each of them can be different, and it's important to, to explore uh, the different characteristics of your model, uh, uh, and not just a single one. So general comments on subsetting techniques. Um, so leave one out or jackknife is best for low data species. Block subsetting should generally extend to background data, but uh, again, this is not kind of a decided thing. Um, I, would, I would love to see a paper come out that, that talks more about this. 
Um, but in, in theory, I, I think that um, for, for most block subsetting techniques, it would be important to block out the uh, background too. Uh, block subsetting usually results in less optimistic evaluation. So when compared to, say, evaluations on training data, uh, block subsets uh, uh, will result in test evaluation statistics that are uh, quite a bit lower. And this is probably more realistic because it, it forces your model to make a more difficult prediction. It forces it to extrapolate a bit more. Uh, spatial checkerboard is likely to have more even sampling uh, in environmental space than random in general. So if, if that's your concern, you might want to uh, go with spatial checkerboard instead of um, iterate random uh, uh, 100 times. And then uh, some techniques do not ensure even sampling of occurrences. Uh, this is something to watch out for. Um, if they don't, you might want to um, uh, do them over a number of different times or different ways uh, to make sure you have even groups on average. And uh, importantly, blocking can force model extrapolation. So if that is your analysis goal, then uh, block subsetting would probably be the way to go. So general conclusions, cross-validation can help provide estimates of model evaluation with independent data. Uh, this independent data, uh, mind you, uh, could be a real independent data set, or it could represent a uh, subset in cross-validation. There are many ways to subset data. For some examples, you can check out the ENM eval package or the block CV package. Uh, there are a number of other packages that also uh, do this and explore this, and so uh, 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 not not any one of them is 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 superior to any of the others. So please check out all of them. Um, I can try to provide a, a more comprehensive list um, um, uh, along with the code that I uh, that I um, will will uh, make available. Uh, block subsetting has several advantages to random. Uh, please see this Roberts et al. 2017 paper in ecography. It is very detailed, it's very convincing, and it's a very good uh, review of why block subsetting um, is superior in, in, in most cases. Um, but they even talk about caveats where it might not be advisable. So it's a, it's a good read. I suggest you look into it. And um, you should really be choosing subsets based on your analysis goals. Is your goal interpolation? Is your goal extrapolation? Uh, one or the other. And again, that Roberts paper does a good job of, of going over what those are. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, if, you're, if you have questions about uh, data subsetting in general, you could try checking out the Maxent or the Wallace Ecological Modeling App Google Groups. A lot of questions come in um, concerning um, uh, data subsetting and cross-validation and so um, if you have questions, it might be a good idea to, to search those forums even or to ask your own questions. And people are usually responsive and, and, and get uh, answers pretty quickly. Um, so uh, that's that. Thank you very much.